this is Sharon Klander with you today for Arthur Showcase. We have the great good fortune to have Stanley Plumley with us today, who's a poet at the University of Maryland in College Park. He's the author of six books of poems, and his selected poems will be due out this next year. Is that right? Yeah, next spring. Next spring, okay. Uh, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Be my pleasure. <laughs> uh, it was it was you really who started me into poetry many many mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. you were my first mentor in poetry and I remember one thing that you used to say in class that was that has stuck with me and that is that all poems are either of the mother or the father can you describe what uh, that means? well I suppose I mean that and uh, or meant that and uh, both a Jungian sense, an archetypal sense, but also in, in a dynamic and uh, psychological sense, or Freudian sense as well. Um, and I suppose the uh, muse figures is what I was I'm probably talking about. Uh, and lovers tend to be uh, part of, uh, I guess, a triumphant in that respect. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, our emotional lives are generated in relationship uh, and uh, so it follows that to create art there tends to be uh, in a sort of totemic sense the face of the uh, figure behind the mask uh, as an inspirator if you will uh, whether it's poetry music art whatever um, and whether that person that muse figure is acknowledged or not. Uh, I think that person is there. I understand that. I'm going to quote something else that you used to say in one of those early workshops. All right. And that is, if you're sitting at the piece of paper and it's blank and it's frightening and your hand is not quite moving with the pencil, you don't know how to get it moving with the pencil. Yeah. You suggested that we just look out the window and write what we see. Yeah, or give a weather report, um, and that's true whether you have a pen or the, you're at the monitor, co a computer monitor, or typewriter, whatever. Absolutely, it's. Um, uh, I, I think uh, this is a could be a long-winded answer, but to make it short, I think that uh, you have to, particularly in the lyric poem, you have to include the moment uh, in which all of this is happening. However much memory, however much planning has gone into the poem, that moment has to be included. And if you're having trouble, why not start with that moment? And that's part of the... Looking uh, out. So uh, would you see it as, as somewhat parallel to what Richard Hugo calls the uh, triggering subject? Yeah, I suppose. He means it, though, as... Uh, 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 and, it, and he's right, uh, indirection. Uh, and ultimately that, whatever you see out that window or whatever uh, uh, is alive in that moment, may not be in the poem. You may ultimately take it out, make it exactly. blue pencil. Uh, but it does get you going. Right. Uh, it, it, the thing is, we, we're not neutral beings. And whatever we see, we see with eyes of projection. And uh, that will come into it and you'll begin to discover what it is you re were really after uh, that's why so little planning can go into that act uh, uh, because you really don't know quite literally till you've written it right exactly so the truth of the <coughs> poem uh, as emily dickinson says tell the truth but tell it slant yeah that's the slant that's the slant yeah is yeah. that is that the uh, same kind of thing as sorrow will come through no matter what which is well, maybe uh, uh, I'd like to think that joy will come through, uh, and maybe not, not that far apart. Uh, our emotional lives are very complicated, and they're not, they're not singular. They're always part of something else. They're, they're always uh, uh, rich uh, in that way, uh, a, a mixture. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what's very difficult for young poets to understand is just what, what you were talking about not knowing the poem until it reveals yeah, itself yeah. to you, that that process of being patient enough 
for the poem to come. What what kind of advice would you give to students? Well, I don't know about yeah. Patience is one thing, but you still have to work. Uh, uh, you don't. Uh, you, you can be passive aggressive uh, t uh, in that sense too, and uh, you could. Uh, Ossify, just sitting there waiting for the <laughs> divine finger to touch your forehead. Uh, you do have to put that finger on the page. Mm -hmm. You do have to move it. And um, uh, it's in the making, even in the motor skills. That's why I like the handwriting or, or the, mm -hmm. I, I still use the typewriter. Uh, that motor skill, is that connection between the brain and the fingers is essential to this very human activity, I think. And uh, it's the one way in which the writer participates in this act, which is physical. Uh, and, you, and there's no way, uh, and sitting passively, you can only receive for so long. Uh, you have to into that space as an actor as well. And sometimes students have trouble with that. They think they have to come prepared. Uh, it's fear, it's anxiety, whatever it is. Uh, when. The only way to get past that is to start. Exactly. It's an act of will sometimes, just to do that. Writing down the bones. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. No, I know that uh, many times the only way that I can approach the typewriter, which I also use to write poems, is first to clean my house, do anything else I have to do, and then I can come exhausted <clears throat> to the page. <coughs> and it quiets my mind down enough to let the poem, to let the poem. Keats called it. Keats used to, uh, when he was having problems, what he would do is bathe and put on a nice clean shirt and sort of atonize himself. That was his uh, phrase for it. Uh, and then it's as if he were getting dressed up for an occasion. And in this case, it was a piece of paper. Or something uh, very special. He, it helped him sort of get past some other inertia or gravity that was in his way. He was a smart man. Oh, he was a very smart man. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant man. I understand that you grew up in uh, Barnesville, Ohio, which is a rural community. Uh, landscape very different from that of Houston. Um, I also know myself, having been born and raised in Houston and then living for uh, some time in Athens, Ohio, which is a very small university town, uh, much different landscape. Uh, how important it was for me to be in a different landscape for a while, and uh -huh. and I realized how landscape is so important in in framing personality. I was in the foothills of the Appalachians right. in Athens, and and I felt claustrophobic mm -hmm. almost, you know. Mm -hmm. And and other people who lived there, mm -hmm. or who were raised there, felt comforted by yeah. those hills. Yeah. And I just wanted to get back to the flat. I could look for miles in Houston. Uh, do you but you also have an ocean here. See, that's that's, true. that's part of the flatness. That's true. That it does, it isn't uh, the flatness of the, of the Great West, which can be claustrophobic too, that's because true. it becomes an emptiness. Mm -hmm. But because there is an ocean nearby, mm -hmm. that's, it's a filled space. Right. It's a it's yeah. a voyaging space. Uh, uh, it's a sort of trans space, if you will. I hadn't it's different. Of that. It's it different is different. From the You're West. right. Exactly. It is different. <clears throat> People that is one of the things I missed about Ohio when I lived there, is I couldn't go to the water. Yeah, definitely. Couldn't yeah, go I'm to the water. Well, there is Lake Erie, but it's a long way. That's true. <laughs> uh, do you believe that, speaking of landscape, do you believe that in your own work that the place in which you grew up provided you with a particular kind of sight? Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. With content. With content. Content. Yes. Um, and in a way, uh, if, if other people are at the source of one's emotional life, the landscape, and, it, and landscape can be urban scape as well, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, that's the source of the imagination, I think. That's right. uh, it's uh, your encounter with it. Again, it's a relationship. You're not, you're not alone, you're not isolated. And uh, I think when we, as beings, when we begin to feel alone and are isolated or are alienated from that space is when we get into trouble. And the way to get out of that trouble is to try to find a way to reconnect. No matter where you are. That's right. right. No and some spaces are more alienating than others, as you just That's suggested. True. That's true. Yeah. And it does, uh, for me, it gave me a context in which to understand my uh, home landscape that I never would have had mm -hmm. otherwise. I yeah, appreciate it. Right. Yeah. I never would have known yeah. what seasons really yeah. are. Yeah. 
if I had not moved right. to Ohio. Uh, and so now when we have maybe two seasons instead of four here in Houston, I understand a little more why and the difference. Um, I do remember what, with what respect and fondness and even awe you hold for John Keats, his life, his poetry. Uh, could you speak a bit to the inspiration or even mentoring influence you felt in your work? Of a poet like Keats? Of a poet like Keats. Quality. Or maybe it's another well, poet. Well, quality. 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 Uh, and there are other poets. I, I love Stevens. Uh, mm -hmm. There are even moments of Eliot's uh, later work I like, Four Quartets. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, wonderful poems by uh, other people, mm -hmm. uh, of course, too, and even some of my contemporaries. But uh, you, you look for poems that meet you. That uh, it's like having the better tennis partner, right? And uh, uh, that pull you out of, uh, surprise you, pull you out of what you expected, and uh, uh, bring you into a new mm -hmm. space. Uh, you're more alive with right. those great poems. And I go back to them over and over again. I go back to certain pieces by Yeats, mm -hmm. uh, certain passages in Wordsworth, uh, whomever. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, but I think Keats is an especial um, gift to a great many poets, uh, uh, contemporary poets. Uh, in some ways, he defines what modern poetry became, even more than Wordsworth or, or parts of Coleridge, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, certainly more than his contemporaries. Uh, Shelley, who was very much a poet the true romantic poet of that moment, but who doesn't transcend, it seems to me, that era, uh, or Byron, who was really uh, an 18th century poet, and saw himself that way, saw himself as a satirist. He, he hated the label romantic, um, whatever it is. It's his lifestyle that got confused with the poems, but he's a brilliant satirist. Uh, but Keats is a poet, really, who, who inspires a, someone like Steve, Stevens, for example, and Stevens is still seems to me the poet of the 21st century. Uh, he's still ahead. Uh, these things get right. passed along. I think you're right about that. You have a poem in your latest collection, The Marriage in the Trees. It's one of my favorite ones, actually. Uh, Keats in Burns Country. Would you mind reading, reading it for All right. Let, for me, the let me, if we have a moment, preface it by saying that here's Keats in Scotland. Uh, on this wa famous walking tour he and his friend Charles Brown took. Uh, a tour that is often blamed for the beginning of Keats's real health problems, where he oh. caught this terrible cold, or what the English like to euphemize as bronchitis, that he couldn't get rid of. And it's right after this moment that he returns, he doesn't make the whole trip, the whole walking tour. Uh, which is a whole summer tour with Brown. Right after this trip, he immediately returns to London and um, begins to nurse his brother Tom, who is quite ill at this point with, with what we now call, uh, later called tuberculosis, was known as consumption at the time, in this closed space. And because it was winter, uh, without a window open, so Keats is vulnerable and is already predisposed in the family. Uh, to this disease, and here he is just setting himself up. Um, and he saw in Burns someone he was afraid he would become, uh, a poet um, who dies young. <clears throat> Keats in Burns' country. It isn't so much that Burns, like the vest, dies young, nor that he's buried among lowlanders at the borders nor that in 1818 Scotland, in spite of its beauty, is black granite country, nor that the kirk is Presbyterian stone over the soul, nor that the poverty of the dirt far farmer, which Burns was and was poorly, is medieval, nor that even his widow survives and haunts the churchyard. It isn't these hostilities nor those you can imagine, so much as the fact of Burns alive in failure, with only words on paper to compensate his death. 
Tom is alive in Hempstead, hanging on, younger than both of you will ever be again. Scotland's your epic journey to the clouds and to the pillars under them. Yet mostly it's been a ragtag walk between the town's consumptive rain and chilblain wind. Summer but an hour's paley gleam. You think that burns white marble tombs on scale, though nothing of the spirit of the man nor the half-perfect heartbreak of the poems. You write two cottage sonnets on the spot, the first for Tom, the second for yourself. One at the grave, the other at the house Burns was born in. You can't make your mind up how you feel or what is true. All is cold beauty, pain is never done. Then you toast to Burns your own frail mortal body in the thousand days you say you still have left. This is your first warm taste of whiskey, your first real taste of the barley brie of fame. Outside the birthplace windows, the bright fields run to yellow, then to shade, then open north to the bedrock covering of mountains. Burns worked and walked here, you are thinking, and talked with bitches and drank with blackguards, the intimate sublime of what he wrote. You're failing too, and by the time you climb the snow cloud of Ben Nevis, you'll be dead. Uh, I paraphrase and quote a lot from Keats, uh, who wrote about Burns. Some of his uh, very, un, I think, unappreciated uh, poems are about this period in this, in this moment. Um, uh, That's nice. Thank you very much. Um, I know that you've taught in creative writing programs for years. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I would come in and conference with you on one of my poems, how quickly you could go through it and, and see the weak links that needed to be bolstered, soldered, a little extra solder yeah. to hold the rest of the poem together. Uh, how is it that you see poetry workshops now? I, I've often said that I have only been in two poetry workshops in my life in which I believed in which and in which everyone else believed that all we needed to do was help each other write the best poems we can. Mm -hmm. That was it. There was no competition, no backbiting, no mm -hmm. mm -hmm. self-aggrandizing. Um, and one of those two was yours. It's one of the very first ones right. I, I participated in which I participated. Uh, I've told that to students all along. In, in the classes that I teach, that it is possible because mm -hmm. I've seen it, mm -hmm. I've experienced mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is still the basic type of workshop that you see? So well, one would hope so. Uh, workshops are incredibly difficult to teach, mm -hmm. and I think they must be, on the receiving end, equally difficult to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one shouldn't, and I think too many workshops that I've observed observed, try, have tried to pretend that it isn't difficult or that it isn't painful. And have even tried to avoid those issues by various uh, hooks and crooks. And uh, I don't need to go in, I think, to that. I think that's obvious. Uh, if you accept the difficulty and if you accept the pain of it, it seems to me you can get past that pretty quickly and you understand that everyone has the same problem, which is not the individual who writes the poem, but the poem that's being written. And once you address that and accept the fact that it must be the best poem it can be with everyone's uh, conspiring to help it be that, uh, takes the pressure off right. and uh, people are allowed to fail, they're allowed to screw up, they're allowed to have uh, emotional reactions and, and, and whatever. So, well, it's life. Right. We get past that. And at the end of this little journey in a workshop in a given semester, uh, people feel good about what they've done. They respect what they've done. Uh, and they're better at it. And if they're not better at it, then that was a problem. Somebody didn't do the job. Right. As you, I, I often repeat uh, to my students, 
another thing that you said, there can never be enough good poems in the world. That's right. It's not possible. That's right. And so the more good poems right. we could make yeah. in this room. God knows there are enough bad ones. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> or or semi beautiful poems, right, if you will. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, do you believe that for young uh, poets, that perhaps for a while, there's difficulty in being so influenced by uh, a workshop leader or any particular poem that they, any particular poet uh, that they admire, that it. It, it sort of freezes them in a place until they find their own voice. I don't think that's a difficulty if, again, it's accepted for what it is. Influence is inevitable and necessary. Mm -hmm. And the classical method of teaching is imitation. And that's the way to get past it, uh, is to allow the influence to be absorbed, if you will, and passed through the system. Um, uh, people who aren't influenced tend to be uh, isolated from their, their very active learning. Uh, and, and imitation or influence is part of the learning process. That's good, I think. I don't think it has to be encouraged. And, I don't, and, and anyone who runs a workshop who, expect, who expects people to write like that person, then that is a problem. Okay. Um, along those same lines, I'm wondering... Is there a point in all of in all of the time that you've taught students? Do you recognize the change or the turn? Oh sure. To, yeah, but we usually recognize it together. It may not be acknowledged by that. Usually not by the student, but and it's the teacher's job to acknowledge that. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful moment uh, because it confirms something the student may know, intuit or otherwise be aware of, but is probably afraid to say f for superstitious reasons. Right, right. And I suppose we should always knock on wood when we do acknowledge that moment. But people, yeah, they reach a place, and then they go for a while, and they have to go to they another go place. Beyond it. Yeah. I also know that you've taught for the University of Houston in its London program. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I think some years ago. That was a long time it ago. It was a yeah, long time almost, ago. Almost, uh, God knows when. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember. The semester Maybe that, almost 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, I remember the semester that you traveled to uh, London, and we, meaning you and the work in the this undergraduate workshop, had just yeah. completed yeah. three semesters in a row, and we continued to meet yeah. afterwards. Oh we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We just couldn't stop. Yeah. yeah. Well, London was a good place to meet, don't you think? Yes. <laughs> uh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And the students, yeah. uh, were they American or British? All kinds. All kinds? All kinds. I just did uh, a workshop in Prague this summer. Oh, really? And students came from all over the world, and they were all kinds of ages. Some from F refugees from MFA programs, some still in MFA programs, some in their 40s, some in their 50s, whatever. Uh, it reminded me of the YMHA classes I taught zillions of years ago uh, in New York. And... Uh, 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 the talent level was extremely high, and it was a lot of fun. We only we had only a month, but it was a really a lot of fun uh, because they knew what they w were doing. They 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 came there, uh, they grasped the concept right off the bat, and so we. How know. interesting to see the content! It must have been various. Oh, it was great. Quite various. It was great, and they were very supportive of uh, one another. That was great. And again, uh, my point is the exotic setting. It put a certain uh, intensity and an emphasis on the language, on American English. Uh, we were all foreigners in a way, and uh, it, it gave the language an extra kind of uh, value in that context. Mark Strand once told me when he was visiting the University of Houston, and uh, I was to introduce him at a reading that night, that poetry is about language. It's not about anything else. It's just about language. Do you agree with that? No. Uh, of course it's about language, but it is about something else. Because uh, the language is about something else. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to, and that's a, that's a seems to me a shibboleth, mm -hmm. but that's, a, that's a, 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 an opinion that is uh, current in the air. And, and I don't think Mark Strain's poems are only about the language. That. Yeah. Uh, um, 
Well, I think, though, the difference is, is, is the language an opacity or is it a transparency? And that's where the difference between and among poets uh, comes in. And I happen to believe that the language is a transparency. transparency yes. Oh, that's a nice way to put it. Um, in thinking of language as an opacity, I remember in a Tom Lux workshop, the very first workshop I'd ever taken, I was very excited. I brought a poem, and it just happened to be on the top of the stack. I read the poem. He read the poem after me. And then he says, Sharon, I'm so glad you brought this poem. I was thrilled, because this is exactly how you do not write poetry. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> By saying thank you? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, it, it was yeah. wonderful because he was right. Yeah. I didn't know then yeah. what yeah. he meant. Yeah. But it is uh, an anecdote I often tell my students when they're right. nervous about right. bringing in poetry. I said, if I could survive that, yeah. in the very first poem, yeah. in the very first yeah. workshop I yeah. was in, sure. you can survive me. Yeah. You know, it'll, it'll be, yeah. It won't be any big deal. Uh, I understand that you have a selected poems. New and selected uh, coming in the spring. Uh, are you also planning to write uh, criticism? Well, I write it. I just you, don't. I have. I've just published it in magazines. I haven't put it all together yet, but mm -hmm. I'll get around to that. Okay. If you could choose any, what would be? Who would be your favorite poet or poets that you would like to to study in that kind of writing or reveal to us? Uh, you mean if I were? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the thrust of your question. Well. I just, I just wanted. I mean, I know Keats might be one, and, and others, but a modern poet. Oh, a modern poet to write about? Yes. I'd rather write have... about poems I, rather okay. than poets. Uh, that's what I write about. I don't write about poets. I write about their poems, individual poems. Right. Right. And so that gives you, it seems to me, a healthier opportunity to look at a spectrum of taste. And I, and I think my taste is pretty wide. Uh, okay. At least I like to think so. Well, I think we're out of time, but I think this is a great high point to end on, writing about poems and not about poets. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Stanley, for joining us. And once again, this is Sharon Clander for Author Showcase. See you again. Bye. To submit comments or to order a copy of this program, please call 713-718-6273. Or you can send a written request with a check for $19.95 plus $5 shipping and handling to HCCTV, 3821 Caroline, Houston, Texas, 77004. Attention video dubbing. Please include a description identifying the program and indicate the air date and time.